some nice bosses who sign up for these 32 hour week trials. They're great. And I you know, think it's exciting that people are doing that. But actually, in order to win it, we're going to have to sort of win it as we have had to win anything that's good for workers ever. Your article on a 32 hour work week came out in In These Times a while back. Uh, and that is a, um, that's something that, you know, speaking of Sean Fain and the UAW, they have kind of really pushed into the fore. It's not the first time that a 32 hour work week has been discussed in the United States or, and certainly not nationally or, or internationally. Um, and so, you know, the title of your article, if I'm remembering correctly, was uh, a 32 hour work week is ours if we take it or so something along those lines. And so, um, you know, why do you what is it that you think uh, gives you optimism about the potential for winning a 32 hour work week? Well, I mean, you know, uh, journalists don't get to choose their headlines very often. Um, <laughs> but I think, and this is actually connects to what I was saying, right, about this, the, the lack of culture of unionism and the lack of, of recognition that unions are a vehicle for fighting for the entire working class. Um, demands like a shorter working week with no loss in pay, right? It's important to stress that part. Um, those are things that are unifying acro across sort of broad swaths of the workforce. Like, oh, actually work sucks and we don't want to do as much of it. Um, you know, when we were talking to the, the workers at Mercedes, time was their number one issue over and over and over mm -hmm. again. Everybody was talking about forced overtime, the six day week rotating schedule, right? Where they were six days on, two days off. You want yeah. to know something really, really quick, and then I'll, I'll, I'll give it back to you, but it's Ooh. just so funny. Uh, there's this conservative radio host who was talking about, like, oh, you know, here's maybe some of the reasons that the UIW lost at, at Mercedes. And he literally listed one of the reasons that workers at Mercedes voted against the union is because the UAW wants a 32-hour work week. And that's why they voted against the union. I mean, just, I, you know, the idea, because the, the time has been such a, you know, it's not even, you, you hear yeah. some about the pay, but a lot of it is really the time. I spend yeah. too much effing time at work and I want to spend time at home. And then this, you know, yeah. just absolute fool, uh, you know, I mean, you know, he doesn't know anything about, about really very much, but particularly about labor. And so it's just a, it's a very funny juxtaposition, you know, his assertions with reality. Well, like, if you think about that, right, like the, this idea that, you know, do you remember uh, what's his face, the lieutenant governor of Texas during COVID saying like, mm -hmm. oh, well, you know, grandparents will be happy to die so that everybody else can go back to work. <laughs> right, right. And it's like, my dude, no, most people do not want to go back to work, actually. You know, we've seen these waves of sort of trend pieces about the great resignation and quiet quitting. It turns out that work is bad, actually. Um, somebody mm. should write a book about that. Oh, wait. No, right. um, <laughs> and, and like, you know, this, this um, it's interesting because, you know, when I was writing that book, I was thinking about when I was writing Work Won't Love You Back, I was thinking about the change from mostly industrial labor to mostly service labor, caring labor, um, the quote unquote knowledge economy that, you know, you and I theoretically work in um, that like, what is the change here? And one of the changes is that nobody expects you to love working on cars for 12 hours a day. Mm. Right. Nobody expected those guys to sit down and be like, yeah, man, I really love putting wiring harnesses in the front end of a Mercedes every day. Mm -hmm. No. Right. And so it always sounds a little bonkers when people try to apply that language back to like industrial labor, like, oh, the workers love working six days in a row, driving two hours each way and being there for 12 hours. And then, you know, they, they love that. It's great. That's what they would love to be doing with their day. Of course not. But actually it's moving back in the other direction too, where, you know, people who are supposed to love our jobs, um, we are also saying like, mm, maybe there are better things I could do with my day than, you know, sit in front of a laptop for 12 hours. Um, she says, while having sent messages to people yesterday, being like the workers are great and I love my job, <laughs> but I still want to do less of it. Um, <laughs> you know, and like this, this, move towards shorter hours again, right? It was it was a key demand of the labor movement for literally hundreds of years, right? Starting in like the industrial revolution. People were like, oh, this is terrible. I don't want to do so much of it. How do we get out of that? 
um, fight for a 12 hour day, fight for a day off, fight for two days off, fight for a 10 hour day, then fight for the eight hour day. And somehow we got stalled there. Um, and the last time that like a 32 hour week was sort of seriously discussed in this country at higher levels was in the um, leading up to World War II, right? In the, in the Great Depression, when it was a way to spread out the amount of work among more workers. It's like less work, then you can hire more people, then everybody is A, less exhausted and B, more people are getting paid. So you don't have as many people who are flat broke and trying to figure out how to eat. Um, basic things. And like Dean Baker brought up shorter working hours during the Great Recession in you know, 2008, 2009, saying, once again, this would be a good way to do things. Germany actually did it. And you know, I don't really love saying nice things about the Germans, especially because we've just been talking about Mercedes. But mm. the, the way that, you know, especially with automation, especially with you know, AI, although the AI is telling people to eat rocks or something these days, so I'm not too worried about it taking my job. But you know, that's, okay. That's not an if, exaggeration, Adam. Adam is not. No, it really lying. is not if an exaggeration. Google, it was, if you yeah. Google right now, how many rocks should I eat? Google's AI is recommending at least one per day. One rock. Yeah. Right um, on it's, it's great. The, 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 and then like that, putting glue in your sauce. That explains You saw lot. the glue one, right? I, I haven't been taking my rock a day. <laughs> Damn yeah, it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You got to get those minerals, man. Yeah. I heard about, you know, vitamins and this minerals. This show is going to um, be lit once I start my rock yeah. Uh, yeah. diet. Just wait, y'all. Exactly. Go. Exactly. So, right, the, this, like, you know, the, the robots are not exactly an immediate threat to my job. But, like, mm -hmm. what if we had robots who could do the annoying parts of my job? They, mm -hmm. We do have good robot transcription now. I don't have to transcribe my own interviews as much anymore. Cool. Right. Okay. That's like less work that I have to do. Um, what if we actually thought about this in, in all these different forms of labor? Okay, cool. You got robots. Cool. That means we have to work less rather mm -hmm. than you got robots. So now you've got to work at the speed of the robot, right? Where like the Amazon warehouses where they've got the robots have a higher injury rate than the ones where they don't because wow. the robots don't slow down and the robots don't stop and the robots don't get hurt. And, um, the other thing that, that Rick Webster said to me in, in Alabama that has really stuck with me, he's like, you know, you take a job in an auto plant, you think you're going to be an assistant to a robot, but actually you're the robot. Mm. But, and who wants to be a robot? Mm. Right, but right. But if the robots and can't actually take our jobs, cool, they can have some of mine and I can have more time off to go hang out in the park and read a book. Exactly. It's not written by AI. Exactly, yeah. I mean, I've I've always felt that this this fear has overblown in terms of like, Oh my God, drudgery will be taken away from us. Like, Oh no. Okay. Well, I mean, and, and it's like, you know, the, the question is about the ownership and who benefits and who owns these robots and the AI, right? It's not so much that, I mean, if drudgery is taken away by machinery, that's great. That's one less thing we have to deal with. It's just who benefits from that and, and do we actually get that benefit from it? Or like you said, do we have to just keep up with the robots? And I think that's a really essential question that is often lost in like the popular conversations mm -hmm. around this stuff. Yeah, and there's a long history of sort of radicals within the UAW challenging things like the speed up, right? As like new mm -hmm. tech gets brought in um, 60s and 70s, right? You have organizing in Detroit, you have like the League of Revolutionary Black Workers, you have the workers at Lordstown with their wildcat strikes, right? Because like the company brings in new tech and all of a sudden you've got to do 100 cars an hour and like that's uh, exhausting. And so... What does it look like to actually, you know, I mean, A, reopen fighting over the work process, which is a whole other story that we could talk about for three hours. And, you know, I could kick the corks with Walter Ruther around for a little while. But like, <laughs> also just to think about like, what if work isn't actually the be all and end all of our lives? What if there are other things? Um, you know, Sean Fain says, you know, we want to live to work or we want to work to live, not live to work mm -hmm. as I screw it up. Hey, five seconds. Just wanted to say that this is only possible because of our donors. If you want to see more of this, then consider donating yourself at tblr.fm slash donate. It's exactly right. And like, I personally think that this is one of those issues that has so much potential to unite folks. Um, you know, it's remarkable how close we came to this during the mm -hmm. New Deal. And to think that 
like you said, we just kind of stalled out right there. Uh, and here it is 70, 80 years later and we're still stuck. Uh, but I think it's uh, it is an issue that resonates because in any campaign I've dealt with, covered and volunteered for, etc., time is always the recurring mm-hmm. theme. I mean, yes, you hear about pay and healthcare and things like that, but time is like been the most common thing I've heard discussed among teachers, among auto workers, among bus manufacturers, among custodians, like. You name yeah. it, it. Pretty much any worker I've ever talked to in my organizing career, the time has been like the thing mm-hmm. that really weighs upon them, that eats at them, that bothers them um, and impacts their family the greatest. And so uh, I think this is really one of those issues that has a lot of potential for folks. And, you know, Sarah, you mentioned that this this idea uh, or or the it, it's really kind of entered the zeitgeist as far as like we just we work too much. We work too much. You know, 32 hour work week it has to an to an extent. But the idea since COVID has really broken through just generally without m- much more to it that we just we work too much. I want to work yeah. less. Um, and. Uh, but but, you know, even in organizing battles before that, you know, I saw that I, I saw these themes come up with the Warrior Met strike in 2021, which yeah. was mm-hmm. which was mm-hmm. bef- wasn't 2021 before COVID. No, it was no? it was after COVID. Damn. That's yeah, crazy. it's all. It's yeah, all no, but I mean, well, no, never mind. <laughs> retail workers. Right. Like one of yeah. the things that. um Oh, God, I wrote about the Emeryville, California is like sort of, you know, sane scheduling bills. Right. Um, mm. This is also a thing in New York. Um, Starbucks workers, one of the things everybody would talk about was like mm. clopenings, right? Where you got to oh, close the yeah. store down at like 11 o'clock at night and then be right back in at 6 a.m. or 5 a.m. or whatever the hell time Starbucks opens um, mm. to open it back up again. And like with retail, right, it's on call shifts. It's all of these ways that you don't have control over your time. Um, it's happening in hospitals, right? Um, one of the reasons that nurses are always fighting for safe staffing is also long hours and you just don't want to, I mean, I don't know about you, but if I have to go to the hospital, I want the nurses and the doctors to be like well-rested that are working on me. I don't want them to be at the tail end of a 14 hour shift, um, because they're going to be more likely to screw up if they're exhausted. Um, that this culture, I mean, speaking of doctors, like the, you know, committee of interns and residents, this is a huge issue for organizing interns because like physicians who are starting out are expected to work these insane 20 something hour shifts. And like, that's not good for anyone Right. on what planet is that useful to like force people to work force doctors who have to make, you know, important decisions about that are life and death every day to work 22 hours in a row. Like that's nuts. Right. Um, But we've got this, like these cultures and these places that you have to like pay your dues. Um, We've got, particularly since COVID um, where you got sort of, because you had so many people out sick, Um, You would have people just forced to work longer. Um, And now that you have fewer people going out sick, maybe, although, you know, not like COVID's gone, um, but you have people pushed to work that long because the company just sort of realized they could do it. And like, there's a reason that like Marx wrote that like the, the, you know, God, I wish I could quote it offhand. I really can't. But the, you know, the, the main struggle has always been the struggle over the length of the working day, Mm -hmm. because the best way for the boss to wring more surplus labor out of you is just make you work longer every day. Right. And like, this is, you know, right. This is, this is sort of a central battle that, um, American unions have largely abandoned and it's been sort of think tank people and politicians, right? Mark DeCano introduced a 32 hour bill several years ago now. And Bernie Sanders has now introduced a similar one in the Senate. Like, but we're not, we haven't been seeing it led so much by a big union. And particularly we haven't seen a big union putting it in a demand that led to a strike. And so even though, you know, it was sort of obviously going to be a bargaining chip this time around, like they obviously weren't going to get it. Um, I think it's important to keep talking about it. I think it's important that they keep talking about it. Um, It's important that like the Postal Workers Union, which is, I believe, the biggest collective bargaining contract in the country, um, is pushing forward on this and is leading on this issue. Um, There's another place where automation has become a huge issue, but also where COVID was a huge issue, right? Because who kept working and who did so much more work? 
during COVID when we were all ordering way too much shit on the internet, um, <laughs> that would be your postal workers. Um, and so seeing this, you know, as a labor issue, once again, and not just an issue that's going to be like handed down from above from nice politicians or, or nice bosses who sign up for these 32 hour week trials, which are great. And I'm, you know, think it's exciting that people are doing that, but actually in order to win it, you're going to have to, we're going to have to sort of win it as mm-hmm. we have had to win anything that's good for workers ever. And, um, yeah, and the fight's not going to be easy, but I think it's really, really important for labor to think about um, all of these issues that are that transcend one particular workplace, right? Again, it's a way to say to people, like, actually, the union winning this is sort of good for everyone. Right. One of the things that Sean Fain did following the uh, stand-up strike was call for unions to align their contract for May 1st, 2028. Um, oh, yeah. Our Labor Council is part of an effort to get Labor Councils across the country to take up that, to, to you know, answer that call, uh, to get, to encourage yeah. their affiliates to answer that call. Um, and, uh, you know, over the course of talking to people about this, somebody, um, somebody asked me, and, and it was an interesting question, um, somebody asked me, you know, for, for what? What is the, you know, what is the thing that we're aligning our contracts? And, you know, I, I understand I'm a unionist. I understand that we have more leverage together, um, you know, yeah. in, in 2028, uh, you know, it would be beneficial. What, what are we, you know, is there a demand yet for right. 2028? Oh. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, I, uh, there's not at this point, you know, it's just a call to, yeah. to pull, you know, to, to, to use the leverage that we have and then make the most use of it that we can. But there had, but the UAW has not put forward, you know, this is going to be a strike for a 32 hour work week and neither have, you know, the labor councils that are part of the independent effort uh, to, to push this to our affiliates. And so I thought that was an interesting question as, you know, an interesting in um, how, how do you come to a demand in mm-hmm. 2028? I think a four-day work week seems yeah. like an obvious one, but is would it be appropriate for the UAW and and the half a dozen or so labor councils that are tr- that are leading this effort to decide that is to decide that's going to be the issue in 2028, or do we try mm-hmm. to yeah. you know it's kind of like a chicken and the egg you know do can can we actually convince unions and and workers to align contracts? for 2028 if we don't have a, a message first or or yeah. a, a goal but if we create a goal right now it's not exactly very democratic because right. you know definitionally people aren't on board yet we're trying to get people on board yet so you know what are your thoughts about that should it, you know <laughs> should should people that are that are doing this right now uh you know should we be putting forward you know align your contracts for a 32 hour work week in 2028 yeah. or you know, should we be kind of leaving that to discussions and debates in 2027, 2028? This is a really, really interesting point, actually. I think um, when you think about these kinds of things. So I was just rereading Jane McAlevey's first book where she talks about her experience um, running the SEIU Healthcare Local in Las Vegas and working on getting all of the hospitals in town lined up. Um, but that makes a lot of sense when you think about it, because it's all the hospitals in the same union um, and you're trying to get all, you know, all the nurses, all the um, hospital workers in one town to have like the same pay rates. Right. Um, that makes sense. Great. Um, that's an easy one. When you're thinking about like lining up all your contracts, but you have a bunch of different kinds of unions. Um, the most recent place I've seen people do this is in Minneapolis this spring. Um, and in March, a bunch of unions and community organizations lined up their deadlines for the same date, around the same date, the same week, basically. Um, and the thing that was interesting with that, right, is that like some of the unions settled, some of the unions walked. Um, but you, so you have this potential for like, I don't remember how many thousand workers, 15,000 workers or something like that to be on strike at the same time. And that was across two school districts. It was across um, public and private sector. Um, it was all of these different types of workers thinking about their particular demands in their particular workplaces, but also there are sort of common pillars, right? That they're talking about good housing, good schools, good wages, um, and the climate crisis. And unions have different ways that they can um, fight on each of these issues, right? Like some of the, the parks workers in Minneapolis have like 
climate issues that are very obvious to them, whereas like teachers may seem like it's less obvious. Um, but we've seen, you know, we've watched bargaining for the common good campaigns where people include all sorts of things in their bargaining that are not necessarily and not technically legally, um, you know, subjects of bargaining. And so I think there's there's something powerful to be learned in the question of sort of loose demands, right? About loose alignments that say like, okay, you know, all of you can have your strikes, your, your deadlines looming and some companies will settle. And okay, what does that look like? Um, what is your sort of obligation to that if you're all aligning your contract expiration and then your boss comes to you at say, you know, again, parks workers local in wherever you might be and says, we're gonna give you the best contract you've ever seen your workers are probably going to take it, right? To like have sort of internal union democracy, you've got to have the ability for those workers to take the deal, right? If they want the deal. But also, you know, that leverage alone, just the possibility of like, oh my God, citywide strike, everything is snarled up for, you know, a week, two weeks. Um, that alone, you know, it gives you power and aligning around some big top line issues that like everybody can understand what they are seems really helpful, but like, right. You have this challenge of like unions are accountable to their members and their members are in a specific workplace and have specific conditions that they're fighting for. And also what does it look like to think about this as a, a working class movement that wants mm. to fundamentally change the division of power in our screwed up society. Right. Right. Uh, by way of wrapping up, you know, you've alluded to, um, your, uh, previous book, work, work, won't love your, uh, work, won't love you back. Um, yes. and you know, uh, how there's, you know, this kind of weird propaganda around why everybody should love their job. You should love the drudgery. You should love all of this kind of stuff. And you should sacrifice yourself at the altar of capital. That's the good moral thing to do. Um, yeah. and, uh, you've got a new book coming out as well um so you know what are some of the things that that you know we've been talking about today and and that are just generally you know kind of relevant to folks uh listening that that you know folk, folks uh would take away from from reading those books um work is bad actually um capitalism is <laughs> also bad and it wants you dead um, yep. And I'm only sort of joking because this book up here is about grief. And um, one of my big theses is just kind of capitalism wants you dead and can't really, as it's built, see us as anything other than those robots that the Mercedes mm. workers were talking about. So to actually think about, um, again, fundamentally changing the division of power in this screwed up society, um, how do we think about being human? I guess is the the sort of con this, this obnoxious thread between these two books is like actually we live in a world that is not designed for human life. Um, it is designed or non-human life to be fair, and it's making us completely miserable and telling us that there's something wrong with us if we're completely miserable. Hmm. And actually, um, in the the recent book, I sort of latch onto Walter Benjamin's suggestion that revolution is actually grabbing for the emergency break. Um, it's putting a stop to the way that the world chews us up and spits us out. And from that kind of position, how do we imagine something else? Hmm. Right. I like that. I like that a lot. And um, before we let you go, I also wanted to give you a chance to mention your podcast as well, uh, in yeah. case folks are curious about that. Yeah, well, I am. Well, I'm technically now the host of two podcasts, um, one mm -hmm. of which is called Belabored, which is a labor podcast that is currently on hiatus, but I swear we're coming back soon. <laughs> um, and you can find all of the back episodes at descentmagazine.org slash belabored. Um, and then just to be fun, my friend and I just started a, a lefty advice podcast. So if you're interested and have questions about uh, various and sundry things, we will give you advice. It's called Heart Reacts, and you can find that wherever you find podcasts. That sounds really interesting. Okay. <laughs> uh, we sometimes yeah. get uh, solicited for advice, so we'll be sure to yeah. share those with you. <laughs> All right. Uh, Sarah Jaffe, freelance journalist, author, Work Won't Love You Back, and other books. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. 
Thank you. So, um, lots of other stuff to talk about today. We have, um, or well, at, at least one other thing to talk about. Um, and that is, you know, the big, the, you just saw a clip from the Valley Labor Report. We are live every Saturday morning from 9.30 a.m. till 12.30 p.m. And we pride ourselves on keeping all of our content free to everybody so that we can talk to as many working folks as possible. If you support the work that we're doing, you think that it's important, you think that it's good, then consider making a monthly contribution to the project. And you can do that on our website, tvlr.fm. Which side are you on?